Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Dedicated Physionic Podcast. My name is Nicholas Verhoeven. If you're not familiar with who I am, I am a PhD student in molecular medicine and have my master's in exercise physiology, and I've done laboratory work in cellular biology, metabolism, and now autophagy. So today, today's podcast episode is going to be discussing the differences between different types of fat, white fat and brown fat. So where I'm not talking about polyunsaturated, monounsaturated, I'm not talking about dietary fat, I'm talking about body fat. So the actual cells that make up our body, adipocytes. And our body is made up of white fat and brown fat, but predominantly white fat. And while I don't want to necessarily say that something is positive or negative, white fat is pretty much like the little brother of brown fat because brown fat is highly metabolically active and it's actually something that we as newborns have uh, far more larger proportions of brown fat. But as we age over time, even in our teenage years, we tend to have a conversion to white fat. And white fat is uh, what we're typically associated with. And it tends to be far less metabolically active, meaning that it doesn't burn as many calories as brown fat. Now, there's a group, uh, I believe out of Rutgers University, that has looked at how brown fat relates to branched chain amino acids. Branched chain amino acids are essential amino acids, meaning that they are amino acids that are found in proteins because all proteins are made up of amino acids. And those essential amino acids are amino acids that we have to consume. Our body absolutely necessarily needs them because if uh, we don't consume them, then we die. Uh, So incomplete proteins in that regard are an issue. That's why vegetarians and vegans have to worry about, well, not necessarily have to, but that's a common concern for individuals that are vegan or vegetarian. Now, BCAAs are linked, are associated, correlated. I use three different ways of saying that because it's important for us to understand that they're linked to diabetes and obesity. So higher levels of BCAAs in the bloodstream are correlated with higher levels of adiposity, greater levels of obesity, diabetes, things of that nature. Now, that's a cautionary tale because should we necessarily say BCAAs are causing obesity? No, they're not. Although I do have some content looking at BCAAs and their impact on feeding behavior, which is really, really interesting research that's starting to come out, how BCAAs may have a negative impact on our food consumption behavior. But this group out of Rutgers found that in brown fat specifically, there's a protein, a transport protein called SLC25A44. Didn't get very creative with that name, but that transport protein allows branched chain amino acids into the mitochondria and that organelle that produces energy, allows those amino acids into the mitochondria to be used up for energy. So the brown fat has a protective effect against this diabetes and obesity association that comes along with increases in branched chain amino acids. So this could have an impact later on. I will say, like my personal opinion is I don't necessarily think that this is going to have a substantial impact because we still have to figure out how to convert white fat to brown fat. While there's some evidence that cooler temperatures or even cold temperatures, but even cooler temperatures like 65 degrees, which I realize isn't that cool for a lot of individuals, but relative to people who live in 90 degree weather all the time, 65 is quite cool. Cooler temperatures tend to uh, sort of convince our fat to go more towards brown fat. But if that uh, convincing maintains over time, that's to be seen. They also mentioned that spicy foods are another thing that may convince our white fat to turn to brown fat. And 
Then they also talk about drugs. If I'm completely honest, I don't think the spicy foods, I don't think that the cold therapy is going to have much of a lasting impact. It may have an impact within an acute sense, a, a short period of time. But if that's going to actually have a, a lasting impact, a chronic impact, most likely not. However, if they did develop some sort of drugs that were to convince some of our adipocytes, our fat cells, or white fat cells to turn into brown fat cells, that could have a protective effect. I don't, I, I don't think that taking BCAAs out of the bloodstream is going to make any impact whatsoever. But I will say that increases in brown fat does lead to an inherent increase in basal metabolic rate. So if that's the case, and I, I haven't quantified it out, but if we were to add on pounds of brown fat, relative to white fat so as in like we don't add more weight we don't add more fat onto our system onto our body but we change the proportion of white fat to brown fat so that there's far more brown fat that makes up our total fat then that could increase our metabolic rate and that could really seriously help in terms of fighting against kind of this obesogenic crisis that uh, especially the western world is going through so i wanted to throw that out there if you want more details on you know all all of this i will have the uh, paper linked that uh, essentially discovered this SLC25A44. Again, I think that that from a molecular standpoint, a cellular standpoint, that is probably the most interesting finding. I don't think that the association be between BCAAs and obesity is all that interesting unless we relate it to a paper that I dissected in some examined content, which you can look that up on the channel. Uh, or on the podcast, uh, you can find that. Just type in BCAAs and Physionic and you'll find it. It'll be there. Anyways, with that said, I hope I have the absolute pleasure of speaking with you in the next one and have a wonderful, wonderful day. Have a good one, guys. See ya.